This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I'm Sadie Eck. And I am still Courtney Eck. And we are still sisters. And this is still our true crime podcast. I think you said that already. I did. I did. It's Courtney's night. She said it's a good one. So let's do it. Yeah. And I have to give a shout out to a listener, Chianti, who uh, wrote two days ago, actually, and recommended this one. Holy moly. I know. And whipped it up. I whipped it right up. Uh, Luckily, it's one of those ones that came together very easily. And it's just a fucking crazy ass story. So thank you so much for the suggestion, Chianti. And real quick, somebody recommended a murder of a family several months ago and i wrote back to them and i said it's on the list i cannot find the name of the family and i cannot find that message so if you're listening i haven't forgotten i just cannot remember the name of the family so please message us on the side because <laughs> i want to do that case anyway you didn't actually get it onto your random list no it's more of like a, a the idea of a list of this sort of mm-hmm. I either text myself cases, that's my system, or I just remember them. But uh, that, <laughs> whoop, right out the right out of the old mm-hmm. brain list. Mm-hmm. So anyway, this is the strange and terrible revenge of Dr. Anthony Garcia. So on March 13th, 2008, in the upscale neighborhood of Dundee in Omaha, Nebraska, 11-year-old Tommy Hunter came home from school like any normal day and walked through the front door of his home and into a nightmare. Tommy had three older brothers who were already out of the house and was described as an extremely bright kid who loved science and math and playing Xbox and was a typical, happy, all-American little dude. When he arrived home that day, he grabbed an after-school snack and headed to the TV room to play video games. At some point, he went upstairs where he was ambushed and stabbed to death a few feet away from the back door. Oh, no. Yeah, man. The family's housekeeper, who is described as a loving, gentle, and nurturing mother and grandmother, 57-year-old Shirley Sherman, was also overpowered and attacked with a knife and died in a pool of her own blood near her bucket of cleaning supplies that she had packed up because she was just minutes away from leaving for the night. What the... Just what? Yeah, a little boy and the family's <laughs> housekeeper. No. Tommy's father, Dr. Bill Hunter, came home around 5 o'clock p.m. to find his son and Shirley dead, and he immediately called 911, knowing they were well beyond being saved at that point. Very disturbingly, the knives used to kill the victims had been left in their bodies... Oh, and no. knives and knives had also been placed around the house. Oh no. Nothing appeared to be missing from the home and Shirley had over $800 in cash in her purse that was still there when the police arrived. I don't like you know I don't like stabbings. I mean nobody likes st- stabbings. Oh, uh, middle of the day. You're not supposed to come home from school and get stabbed like that's just not he had like a bag of chips and a full he brought like the full box of dr peppers down there with him just a little sweet 11 year old baby fucking boy stop please it's fucking awful they didn't find any dna or other clues in the home and there was no clear reason initially why anyone would break into a home in broad daylight to murder an 11 year old boy and the family housekeeper One neighbor did report a strange car in the neighborhood that day and described it as a silver Honda CRV with out-of-state plates and a dark-haired man driving it who got out at one point and walked north carrying a bag. And the the people who know that cars are strange, I, I I am in awe of that level of awareness of your fucking surroundings. So good for those of you who would be able to point out an unusual car in a neighborhood. 
Yeah, I know. You know? Our, our, uh, yeah, our neighbor was in the hospital for a while, and it took us, like, way too long to realize that something was wrong, you know? That would be exactly me, yes. Yeah, I was like, wait, is that, who is that? I don't know. I haven't seen our neighbor very, you know, in a while. Yes, yes. Laura knows when our neighbor Steve's car hasn't been in the driveway for a few days. I'm like, how the fuck? She's like, I'm worried about Steve. Hopefully he's out of town. What are you talking about? He, I mean, I can see his house right now. I, it's so close to my house. I'm always right. in very clear, open view of his home. No idea. So thank you to the neighbors of the world who pay that fucking close attention. Seriously. So it was clear to police that Tommy had been attacked first, and they wondered if he had attracted the attention of an online predator through his gaming Tommy Hunter's father and mother were both doctors and worked at Creighton Medical Center, which is described as the heart of the community, and many people in the neighborhoods where the victims were murdered work there. Both doctors, Bill and Claire Hunter, were by all accounts loved equally by residents and patients and were well respected by their peers. Police looked into employees of Creighton who could have been angry at the Hunters, including people Bill Hunter had fired over the years but none seemed like likely suspects. They looked into the possibility that Shirley was the target or that it had been an interrupted robbery or maybe just a random act. And in the end, police never had any other clues or leads that panned out and the case went cold, leaving endless unanswered questions for the loved ones of Tommy Hunter and Shirley Sherman for years. Wow. That's so crazy like what how do you even begin to know how to solve something like that it makes no fucking logical yeah. sense well, did they get the impression that the two were stabbed like at the same time yes you know, like right back to back okay yeah yeah tommy was attacked first they believed and then surely immediately okay. after then five years later on mother's day of 2013 just six miles away from the dundee neighborhood of omaha the Butras, who were also both doctors at Creighton Medical Center, went to brunch with some elderly friends, and on the way home, they received a call that their burglar alarm was going off. The elderly couple they'd gone to brunch with had been very slow moving, like they were walking with walkers, mm-hmm. and the Butras now know that if they hadn't taken extra time to get back to their car, they probably wouldn't be alive today. Oh, boy. When they got home... Take your time, people. Take take your time. Take your time. Just don't get there when you're not supposed to get there, and you'll be fine. Done. When they got home, they saw that the basement door was ajar, but nothing was out of place in the home, and no one else was there. Ugh. That's so spooky. Yup. Meanwhile, just down the street, 65-year-old Dr. Rumbach was painting the entryway of his home to prepare it to be sold so he could retire and move away with his 65-year-old wife, Dr. Mary Brumbach. Brumbach had worked throughout his career on childhood diseases and Alzheimer's, and Mary was extremely well-loved and had no enemies in the world. I'm so mad right now. You should be. I am. <laughs> God. You're about to get a lot fucking madder. On that Mother's Day, the couple FaceTimed with their adult daughter, and a few minutes later, someone knocked at the door. As soon as he opened the door, Dr. Brumbach was shot to death and was Ugh. also stabbed several times. Again, broad fucking daylight. Oh. Mary was attacked in the living room and had very clear defensive stab wounds on her hands and was also stabbed several times around her face and neck. Can we stop it? It's already done, my friend. It is already done. Once again, the knives were left at the crime scene. Two days later, a piano mover arrived for his scheduled appointment to help move the couple's piano and discovered a gun magazine and bullets just inside the front door and called 911. Two days later? Yes. They laid there for two days. Yeah, they had just, I mean, they'd like talk to their adult daughter on FaceTime. Right. Knock, knock, knock. Stabbed. So Damn it. nobody would have known. Yep. And it wasn't close enough quarters for like neighbors to hear the gunshot? Or... I guess not. I mean, I don't know how nobody yeah. heard it because it's the kind of neighborhood where 
Like think of Indianapolis, for example, like where the big mansions are. Mm-hmm. You know, like the like bigger close but not lawns. Yes. Yeah, there's like room. suburban with huge like brick kind of colonial homes. That's what it looked like. So the same detectives who investigated the murders of Tommy Hunter and Shirley Sherman happened to be on call that day, and they were struck immediately by a disturbing similarity to the murders of Tommy and Shirley that they investigated in 2008, as all of the victims were stabbed repeatedly around the right side of their faces and necks. So, like, identical. Oh, wow. Yeah. Identical sort of motion and placement on all four Ooh. victims. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Shivers. That's S- not cool. No, it's extremely not cool. Police immediately assumed the cases were connected and were baffled by who could possibly want to harm four such innocent people. Right. Who's going after doctors? And like in retirement age, you know, the three sort of people nearing retirement age and an 11 year old boy. Like, so crazy. What the fuck could the motive possibly be for those four people? So they did a little digging and quickly realized that Dr. Brumbach also worked at Creighton Medical Center and worked in the same office in the pathology department as Tommy Hunter's father, Dr. Bill Hunter. Dr. Brumbach was the chairman of the department and Dr. Hunter was in charge of the program's residents. While authorities were busy looking for more pieces of the puzzle, the Butras called police the day after the Brumbachs were murdered to report that someone had tried to break into their home, which brought the total count of doctors who worked at Creighton's pathology department and had been the target of criminal behavior to three. Wow. So all of those people worked in the same department at Creighton. Huh. I'm... I almost said I'm bespeckled. <laughs> That's are you, uh, yes, this is bes- so bespeckling. I don't mm. think bespeckled is a word at all. No, really? I don't think so. It's a, It should be. It's like bespectacled mm-hmm. or speckled. Right. Keep go, Let's just keep rolling with let's it. Let's keep going. For the let's future. Go. I'm, be- yeah. I'm bespeckled. You're Courtney, bespeckled. Tell me more. Please tell me more. Authorities determined that the people who worked at Creighton, who would have had the potential to be the most affected by the doctors, would have been the program's residents. And so they pulled all of the residents' files dating back to the year 2000. One of the files they investigated was for Dr. Anthony Garcia, and he stood out as he'd been briefly considered as a potential suspect after Tommy Hunter was murdered as he'd been fired by Dr. Bill Hunter from the pathology residency program in 2001. Hmm. Garcia's professor... Mm. Go ahead. The, that first murder it was like 2008? Yes. Wow. Somebody's really holding a grudge. Oh, we'll get to that. But yes, that yes. is a very astute... Well done remembering dates. I Thanks. don't ever generally remember them when you say them, so good job on that. Thank you. I'm a genius. <laughs> he, clearly. <laughs> Garcia's professor had been Dr. Chandra Butris, who described him as, quote, a bad guy and a bad student. And she worked no. very hard to convince Dr. Hunter to fire Garcia from the program. That's not good. She wrote scathing reviews of Garcia during his time in the program. And eventually Dr. Hunter and, Dr. and Dr. Brumbach did indeed fire him. Quote, Butris labeled Garcia as disruptive, manipulative, anti-authoritarian. She gave him essentially the lowest possible marks, concluding that his knowledge was very poor and that he took no initiative and no responsibility for his cases. So the three doctors who had been responsible for Garcia's termination were the three doctors who had been targeted in Omaha. Mm Mm-hmm. Anthony Garcia was a seemingly normal kid from a middle-class family who grew up an hour east of L.A. in Walnut, California, and played football and participated in other perfectly normal activities. He had a loving family, and his brother said they were raised to be good kids and do the right thing. Their mother was born in Mexico and immigrated to the United States, and their father fought in Vietnam, and they were able to achieve the typical American dream working for the post office and as a registered nurse. Anthony was a good student and an altar boy and went to college in California, followed by med school in Utah, and had dreams of becoming a brain surgeon. 
1999, Anthony's father helped him pack up all of his belongings and move across the country to start his first residency in Utica, New York. That residency did not go well, and Garcia was accused of acting unprofessionally and even yelled at a technician in one instance. Garcia resigned from that residency and went back home to regroup. Hmm. So, like, up up until that point, things were pretty fine. I mean, according to his parents and his brother, and I watched interviews with them, and they do seem just like the cutest, loveliest, most unassuming middle American family. But yeah, mm. no reports of violence in high school or anything. So yeah, no, nothing to indicate that he could potentially kill four people for right. no fucking reason. Yeah. So Garcia persisted in finding a second residency and somehow he was able to land another at the Creighton University Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And from the little I know about medical residencies, I know it's not an easy thing to get another one. Right. right? They're extremely right. competitive. Yeah. Yeah. And if extremely... you don't do well in one, nobody's going to give you the time to do another one. Exactly right. So aside from his poor academics, he pranked a chief resident, rolled a body onto its face, disfiguring it. Oh, no. He, he would essentially write emails to Dr. Hunter to doc shit about Dr. Butrus. Oh, no. And he more or less acted like an obnoxious child in a job that requires the utmost professionalism. Huh. Then in 2000... Go ahead. <laughs> that's just very... Tr that's troubling. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. one thing to be like Patch Adams and have a kind of goofy, upbeat personality. Yeah. But yeah, to like prank chief residents and just act like a fucking teenager, like a weird, a bratty. And obviously read right before from Dr. Butrus's assessments of him, he was just unmotivated. He wasn't doing well. He wasn't taking his cases seriously. He was just fucking around, basically. Hmm. So then in 2001, after a slew of terrible performance reviews prepared by Dr. Butrus, Anthony Garcia was fired from his residency, which for most people would end their medical career completely. Mm -hmm. Garcia headed home once again, and his family said that depression and migraine headaches were the reason he said he was unable to complete his residency and that he was determined to continue pursuing a career in medicine. Then somehow, by the grace of all gods and goddesses, Garcia landed a third residency at the University of Illinois Hospital in 2003, and also managed to complete his training for his medical license, making him Dr. Anthony Garcia. Oh, no. So for the next few years, Garcia moved around the country working in small clinics and in a prison hospital. And I don't know if he was working as a doctor or if he was just working in the medical profession. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But I think right. he was where I got the sense that he was working as a doctor. So every time he moved to a new state, he'd have to apply for a new license for that state, and every state would go through his full history to determine whether or not to give him one, and their search would lead to the fact that he was fired from his residency at Creighton. The medical boards of each state would reach out to Creighton for more information about his time there, and Creighton would send back very negative feedback about his time as a resident in their program. So in February of 2008... Garcia was living in Louisiana, and the state denied his request for a medical license, and a large part of their decision was based on the fact that he'd been fired from Creighton. Mm -hmm. I also read that he'd actually been in another residency there and was fired because he'd failed to mention that he had been fired from Creighton. So, so just like all around bad news town. Just yeah. Making shit decisions and... Jumping from state to state and... Try, like reapplying, I'm assuming he's burning bridges on some right. level and trying to stay in front of it, knowing full well that... It's all going to come know, crashing down around him. Well, and that doctors can kind of, as we all know from Dr. Death, doctors can sort of evade mm -hmm. their issues if they try hard enough. So whichever the case, three weeks after he'd received this news in Louisiana... Tommy Hunter and Shirley Sherman were stabbed to death in the Hunter's home. Wow. 
So police knew that there had been a suspicious sighting of a silver Honda CRV in the Dundee neighborhood where Tommy and Shirley were killed, and so looked into what car was registered to Garcia at the time. Want to take a guess? A purple Kia. I wrote a burgundy Dodge Neon. <laughs> great minds, sister. Great mm-hmm. minds. Nope. It was not a purple Kia. It was not a burgundy Dodge Neon. It was a silver Honda CR motherfucking V. Mm-hmm. So if the police's hunch was true, Garcia would have carried a grudge for seven years before he carried out the first murders and 12 years before wow. the second. That's so fucked up. Which is so unbelievably awful and childish, it's hard to begin to imagine it could be true. Yes. So they dug deeper. So in 2013, Garcia was living in Terre Haute, Indiana, mm-hmm. and was working, I know, and was working in the city's prison hospital, but was fired from that position that year. He was driving a Ferrari at the time. God, of course he was. And, <laughs> and seemed to be doing all right for himself, but authorities were determined to figure out exactly where he was on May 12th of that year, the day the Brumbachs were murdered. They looked into his cell records and found that his phone pinged off of a tower in Iowa, just an hour outside of Omaha. He also purchased food at a wing stop in Omaha and was caught on camera buying a case of beer just outside of Omaha on the same day. Wow. So, probably wasn't in Omaha. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Armed with all of this evidence, police moved to arrest Garcia, but he was not in Terre Haute. They had a terrible feeling that he could be heading south to Louisiana to enact revenge and kill once again. No. I know. Detectives in Omaha reached out to other police districts and the FBI for help, and Garcia was quickly pulled over by Illinois State Police at 8.30 in the morning, drunk as a skunk, and arrested him. Good. Uh... In his car, they found a crowbar, a sledgehammer, and a gun. Oh, no. He's just doing some demo. Yeah. Gun, gun style. Gun demo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just shoot a thousand tiny holes into cabinets until they yeah. disintegrate. And I just sweep them right them away. away. Yeah. Just sweep them away. It's a very expensive way to do demo, but <laughs> kind of satisfying right there at the end. I'm kind of getting shivers actually thinking about doing that. It sounds awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Just like turning it into lace and then... Uh-huh. Anyway. Police searched his house in Terre Haute, and despite the fact that he'd been driving a Ferrari, the house was basically empty, and it looked like no one planned to return, with just an air mattress and a few other pieces of furniture inside. So I think, he thinks he might be car poor. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have you a know lot what else kind of level of, well, the level of doctor that you have to be to drive a fucking Ferrari mm-hmm. at your, like, p- prison clinic. Right. Doctor. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're like a plastic surgeon or a brain surgeon or a cancer doctor. That's right. it. So they found several documents on the dining room table, like the deed to his house and his medical license, just all sort of pot in piles, just all laid out. In the kitchen sink, they found a black plastic trash bag full of wet documents, and it looked as if someone had been trying to destroy them. The documents were handwritten, and some pages were simple grocery shopping lists and then others said things like, quote, invade rich house, torture, murder. No, it didn't. <laughs> and in another column, oh, God. quote, rich children, gun, invade, kill, knife, garage, kidnap family, SUV, torture, kill. Oh, my God. And then the fucking amusement park of forensic evidence continues with... Quote, wear band-aids on your fingertips. Wear common Sears bought shoes. Park away from the house. And his escape plans, rent a boat. Hide gun in hand. Flee via Canada or the Gulf of Mexico. Like, Ugh, I'm rolling my eyes so bad. I mean, granted, I admitted earlier that I couldn't keep the name of a family that had wanted to cover their case inside of my head. But if I was going to brutally murder a bunch of people and then try to get away with it, just... Memorize it. Yes. It, it. I mean, like, do they want to get caught? Yes. They have to want to get caught, right? Or they're just either just so cocky. He just didn't think anybody would ever right. catch him, so he didn't yeah, care about the that. evidence. There's that. 
And and they enjoy it. I think that's really what it comes yes. down to. When I hear about them meticulously, like, writing... I didn't mean, it was, like, a giant trash bag full of papers. And yeah, so... Yeah, it's so crazy. And he'd written, like, we live, we die. We live, we like, over and over and over again. And just, just like, enjoying the process of plotting this fucked up revenge. So... Along with the absolutely horrifying reminders from hell, police also found Garcia's performance reviews signed by Dr. Butrus and his termination letter from Creighton signed by Dr. Hunter and Dr. Brumbach soaking in the sink as well. That motherfucker. Can you believe that? Mm-mm. <laughs> Not what you're looking at. I mean, we'll talk about it more later, but the most ultimate WTF. Police learned that Garcia frequented a strip club named Club Coyote, with a K, and went there to interview dancers and other patrons and met a woman named Cecilia Hoffman, who is a dancer at the club. When Garcia would enter the club, the DJ would announce that, quote, Dr. Tony was in the house. Oh, gross. Pew, 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 I imagine came at the same time. Yes. And Garcia would throw his money around the club very freely. Garcia took a special interest in Cecilia. Oh, it's also one of those, like, roadside, you know, like, trucker. (laughs) Yes. Club coyote, you know. Yeah, I can totally picture it. Yeah, it's not club in Atlanta where P. Diddy goes. You know what I mean? Like, it's a roadside jam. Right. Not to disparage the women who work there, but rolling up in your fucking Ferrari at Club Coyote with a K. Right. Okay, brother. Right. All right. (laughs) So Garcia took special interest in Cecilia and wanted her to be his girlfriend, but she wasn't interested and had begun to try to avoid him and turn him off from continuing to pursue her. In a recorded interview with police, she said that she told Garcia that she only liked bad boys because she was a bad girl. And she was like, I put on my dumb baby voice. (laughs) And she said that he couldn't handle a girl like her. His response was that he, quote, wasn't as good as she thought he was, and that he, quote, killed a young boy and an old woman. Gross. Yeah, very gross. Trying to fucking get a dancer at a club to date you by, like, telling you you murdered children. No, that's so awful. Yeah, buddy. Good job. That club coyote with a K. Garcia was expedited back to Omaha and was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. The prosecution was seeking the death penalty, and Garcia's parents spent their entire life savings to hire a powerhouse team of lawyers out of Chicago to defend him. Oh, I know, I hate poor that. darlings. It's so gross. It's so devastating that these people living the American dream, she's an immigrant, they were so fucking happy that their son was going to be a doctor. I can imagine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then he's just terrible. Yeah, he's just a nice narcissistic monster. So trial began in 2016, and prosecutors set out to paint the picture of a man who killed four innocent people on a quest for revenge, which is also a term police found that he'd Googled. So he Googled the word revenge. No, he didn't. Yep. They also found a quote from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice on his phone, quote, If you harm us, shall I not revenge? (laughs) Can't Uh, even. No. The defense argued that without revenge as a motivation, the prosecution had a gaping hole in their story and also presented a letter of recommendation written by Dr. Hunter just a couple of days after Garcia was fired from his residency. Dr. Butrus said that while they no longer wanted him in their program, they wanted him to still have a chance to find his way in the world, so wrote the letter of recommendation to help him along. Yeah, because that's what decent people do. Well, quote, what program directors do is you try to mentor people, Claire Hunter said. For those of us who are in that business, when you see a generic letter like that, you're like, eh, this is a so-and-so person. You're hopeful that they go to the next place and take advantage of a different environment. You try not to ruin their life. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They know it's doctor code for. Eh. Mm-hmm. Good, <laughs> good luck. Good luck yeah. with that one. Yeah. And then when it comes across your desk, you're like, okay, this doctor's telling me that this guy sucks, so mm-hmm. I'm not going to hire him. 
The defense also went after Cecilia and painted her as a strung-out stripper who was on pills and drunk when she gave her statement. The prosecution argued that she'd had absolutely nothing to gain in giving her testimony, and she never wavered in her testimony throughout her, quote, very long and very arduous cross-examination. Unbelievably, police were also able to find the other piece of the gun that was used to kill Dr. Brumbach, wow. which had been discarded off of an overpass near Terre Haute. Holy yes. shit. So he dropped the clip in the doorway, which is what the piano mover found. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know how the fuck they found the other piece of the gun, but the serial number on the gun matched a serial number on a gun box that they found in his home. <laughs> wow. She saved the fucking box. Jesus. And he must have also purchased it legally. <laughs> Unless guns come in boxes at gun shows. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. throw the box away, bro. Seriously. Get your little Dremel out and Dremel off the serial number, bro. Oh, <sighs> Police also claim to have found DNA evidence on the doorknob at the Butrus home that pointed to Garcia. The defense argued that the prosecution couldn't conclusively place Garcia in Omaha on the dates of the first murders and that Garcia had only been in Omaha on the date of the second murder because he'd been job hunting in the area. Oh, well, yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. After hearing testimony from 50 witnesses, it took the jury just seven hours to find Garcia guilty on all counts. Good. Yes. Between the trial and sentencing hearing, the judge reported that Garcia was extremely defiant before, during, and after the case was presented, and that he only communicated with his family and lawyers through nonsensical letters after he was convicted. Oh, God. His lawyer was like, it was absolute gobbledygook. He's not a well man. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what he wants you to think. He exactly. He refused to show up to court on two separate occasions, and the judge said, quote, defiance doesn't necessarily indicate delusions. Eccentricity doesn't equate to insanity. No, that's not how this works. Fuck no. At one point, he sent a letter to jail officials that said, quote, I rape babies. And on another occasion claims he was gang raped by five workers at the jail, which may or may not be true which led to an investigation that created one of the many delays in his sentencing. Garcia's sentence was handed down in 2018, and he sat slumped in a wheelchair, either asleep or pretending to be asleep during the entire hearing. God. He's also got like a big old giant, like Charles Manson beard. and so, you know, Ugh, just want to shake him. Seriously. In the end, Garcia was sentenced to death for the murders of Tommy Hunter Shirley Sherman, Dr. Roger Brumbach, and Dr. Mary Brumbach. Wow. That is the story of the strange and terrible revenge of Dr. Anthony Garcia. Wow. A.K.A. Baby Man Baby USA. Wah, wah. (laughs) It just... you. How does that happen? I don't know. I guess that you are a sociopath or a narcissist or a psychopath and you're All really bad at everything yes. and shit doesn't go well and you just fixated on the one time that you were like super fired and blame everything on that forever yeah. and then also feels good to plot a revenge because you fucking suck seriously it feels like the frat boy version of american psycho you know? Yeah. Like not yes. as definitely not as cool or well done or as scary, but yeah. also very evil and disgusting. Extremely and... evil. Extremely fucking evil. You broke into the doctor's house and killed their eleven year old son no, to get I revenge for them imagine. fucking firing you. Seven Ugh, years after they fired you. God. Twelve years later you're still going. I just Yeah, twelve so... years later you kill the other doctors after something else goes wrong in your life. It is truly fucking bizarre. And tried wow. to kill the Butrices. Yes. I don't like it. And then we're probably going to kill somebody in Louisiana. <sighs> they fired you. Yeah. God. Yeah. This one's weird, man. This guy is <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've ever No, I've fired so many people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Uh-oh, court. The clock's you know? a ticking. Yes. Yeah. I managed 
a lot of people back in the day. Yep. Sorry, guys. Don't. No murders, please. Nope. So there you go. That's it. Yeah. That wow. Whoosh. Sucks. Whoa. Shattered families. So much tragedy, grief, Seriously, awfulness. I'm so sorry for all of them. It's, I just can't even wrap my head around it, even for a second. Nope. 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 Also, my neighbor died like the year he was retiring. He was so fucking pumped about retirement. And that shit's so fucking extremely sad. Yes. You know, yes. it's always sad. Every all the deaths are sad, but there's something extra bitter and extra mean well, about when you like give your life to helping others and like yes, and pediatric diseases and Alzheimer's were like yeah, two no, of the things I he just, focused on the most. I can't do it, Courtney. No, it's so fucked up. I know. So it's okay. I'm, I don't. Good job. Know. Thanks. <laughs> oh man well I just don't even know how to go from here we never do no the transitions are the worst part yes if anybody has any um, (laughs) written out that they'd like to send us any transitions (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know when you have those friends who uh, always want to talk about themselves so no matter what you say yes they'll just make it about them uh huh so that's kind of what we need. So, oh, oh, Sadie, you just mentioned uh, quadruple homicide. Well, that makes that reminds me of the name Chesney Bengi. <laughs> Ch- Chesney Bengi. Bengi. <laughs> Bengi. Chesney, or Chesney Bengi. <laughs> Chesney Bengi. Or their relative or, or spouse. I don't know which. Brody Bengi. Oh, uh, so- Stop. That's not real. I love it. Bangy, bangy, bangy. <laughs> How about the bird Hori Redpole? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, was that a smooth yes. transition, first of all? Was that a smooth yes. transition? From Yes. Uh how about pinned tailed wida? Yes. Um, how about the street in Massachusetts? Come load and drive. Oh, God. <laughs> Come load and drive. Come load. C U M load and drive. Chris. That is triggering. That's... I don't know what it's triggering, but it is triggering it. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Our darling, darling, mutual, like, brother slash platonic life partner, Clint. Hi, Clint. Hi, hey, Kyle. Hey. Sent us the name Kitchen Dick. They were <laughs> the road, in, right? Yes, they're in Squeam, Washington, <laughs> and they came to the road with their son, Kitchen Dick, and then they realized that it was intersected with Woodcock Road. What is happening? They came to the intersection of Kitchen Dick and Woodcock <laughs> <laughs> in Squeam. <laughs> And they took a picture and sent it to us. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. (laughs) Yes, they did. (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, One of the men that trafficked the most cocaine for Escobar used the alias Ellis McPickles. (laughs) (laughs) God. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, Somebody went to school with pancakes, bacons, and coffees. How is how is that? I just Bre- they went to yeah. breakfast elementary apparently. I love it. And somebody was murdered, or was arrested for murder in their town, and their name was David Lee Ross. <laughs> <laughs> and if this person married their domestic partner, their name would be Brooke Shields, <laughs> <laughs> one of our best friends is Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, because she married someone with the last name Taylor. <laughs> uh today i saw randomly somebody was like who who do you see for your psoriasis or so you know some like medical right. recommendation and someone was like ever since i've seen dr heck <laughs> so there's a dr heck yes um i also saw somebody posted on my instagram there's a queer lake really 
Yeah. Queer Lake. It's fun. I don't know where Queer Lake is. Let's look real quick. They just like screen capped it and put it in their stories and said, this is a place. <laughs> Let's see. Whoa. Oh, in Long Lake, New York. There's a lot of queer, queer lakes. Oh, maybe they're all... It's also in Ontario, Canada, so I'm assuming it's maybe on connected. the border of Canada and New York or something. Yeah, Queer maybe. Lake. Cool. So thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, guys. You. How's everybody doing out there? Not good. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like... Through no that one is good. Like, just I'm, I'm having like borderline panic atta- attacks all the time. It's really intense. So let's all take uh, a deep breath. Well, in uh, it's time to transition from Queer Lake to uh, They Whoop Hill. And yes. you guys yes. have really got, given lots of suggestions for yeah, what, you really Sadie have. Should, what Sadie should pill. Yep. I have a doctor's appointment. Today is Monday. I think I have yep. a doctor's appointment Wednesday where I will get pilled. Oh, I can't wait to find out what pill you get. I know. Pilled. I know. Some people have recommended. We've got, I got a couple recommendations for a medicine I'd never heard of. The one that starts with a G. Yeah. Like gabapentin Gab- or something. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. S- stay tuned. To- but I'm really excited because it's, I don't know about the rest of y'all out there. I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but it's like, oh, COVID anxiety round first round was intense. Yeah. yeah. Second round for me is like, cr- makes me feel like I'm crazy. Yeah. Right. Uh, mostly just because my boys are in school and well, because it's and- really crazy. It's like, it feels very intense that we could get out of the situation and people are actively choosing not to. It makes yeah. Me feel that's really crazy. That's the worst part for me. Yeah. And Delta variant doesn't give any fucks you guys. So if you're out there and you haven't gotten vaccinated, please do. Yeah. Please do. Please. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And you Just want to talk about it. your fears? Email us. I will be so happy to listen and talk to mm. you and we can get you connected to resources, but please go get your vaccine. I seriously yeah. will FaceTime you through it. You call me. I will give you my phone number. <laughs> you can. I will. I will FaceTime you yeah. through your vaccination if you're afraid of the actual shot. Okay. Same. Please do it. I'll FaceTime you every for the rest of your life. <laughs> I really <laughs> while you it, we need to like just keep a live stream of you being like, "Am I genetically mutating? Do I look like I'm genetically mutating?" And I'll be like, "No, you're definitely not genetically mutating." Do you look a little magnetic though? So yeah. Do I? Am I getting some sort of tremor condition? No, nope, definitely not. <laughs> but how Guys. cool would it be if you actually did get magnetic and you could just like attach your keys to your arm and not lose them? Okay, if that, uh, yes, if they were like, this vaccine doesn't save you for anything, but it makes you magnetic, like a new vaccine. Yeah. I am going to get magnetic. (laughs) You sit down on a metal chair and can't get up. I mean, there's definitely problems. Even if they were like, we definitely don't know what the side effects of being magnetic are and won't know for many years, I would still be like, I've had a good run. I'm 42 years old. See what happens. I would love for the last, like, six months of my life to be fucking magnetic. Like, stuck to things all the time. Now I'm imagining all the issues. There was a, uh, it was either an Amazing Stories or a Twilight Zone from the 80s or 90s, where a kid became magnetic, and it was a problem. He was, like, stuck to the lockers. Do you remember that in his school? Yes, I do. So, I don't know. I don't know what how what the workaround is well if it's just like at the vaccination site then you just stick your keys to your arm and you move on with your day yeah maybe you just become uh magnetic in a convenient way and not in a like you're not like super magnet Mm -hmm. so you you can walk away from your car after you exit it yeah you know there you go i don't want it to be an inconvenience but i just want it in a cool way (laughs) (laughs) that's my tagline for all of life (laughs) Right. I don't want whatever I'm about to <laughs> engage with or embark on. I don't want it to be an inconvenience. I just want to do whatever that thing is in a cool way. Yes. Me too. But um, hey, before COVID's we pretty forget... fucking inconvenient. So let's yeah, man. Boom, sucks. eradicate so it. We can. It. We have the solution. What were you gonna say? Uh, we're taking a break next week. Yes. Yep. One day, guys. One, One day, day off. Yep. Give us a give us a break. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the 8th that we're mm-hmm. taking off. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm going to go to 
We're to drive to Cape Cod mm. and hang out in my friend's cottage. So I will be wearing blues, whites, and Nantucket reds. I will be um, avoiding eating lobster because I hate it, but <laughs> it will probably be close to me. And so I won't have any time to, to record this podcast. Her. Right. Yep. We'll still put yeah. out our Patreon episode, but we're not going to do our main feed episode. Right. Speaking so. of Patreon, if you're sad about that, hey. you should go over there. Has yes. anyone else signed I up guess. this week? Yes, they have. I want to give a big, big thank you so much to Michelle C. Michelle Michelle C. Kawabunga, dude. Kawa fucking bunga. She rides waves. She masters the waves. She got up on the board the first time out. And also her dog goes with her, wears funny <laughs> sunglasses, yes. theme shirts. Yep. Hawaiian mostly because yes. it's surfing. She likes the big ones. She gets on gets the toe from the jet ski. Yes, she does get the tow from the jet ski, but also she can tow other people like a jet ski because Whoa. she's so powerful. Fuck. I know. Good Michelle work, Calabunga. Michelle. Mm -hmm. I really want to learn how to surf, so sorry that this was a surf-themed yeah. shout-out, but don't, don't, don't you sorry. want to learn how to surf? Fuck no, I don't. I do. I mean, I think it's cool. I don't want to. I'm really afraid of the ocean, though, so probably not going to happen. Yeah, so much Who water else? up in all of your bits. And... Yeah, sharks. Thank you. But not Michelle Cowabunga. <laughs> she rides them. Rides the sharks. That's right. She steps like from her longboard woo, onto the shark and just rides it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to Jess H. Jess. Jess is from Australia. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. We have so many Australian listeners. <laughs> we really that do. Is so fucking cool. Jess Hunter. Jess Hunter. She hunts some. She hunts. She doesn't hunt fosters because it's been well established that that's not a thing. <laughs> but she does hunt attractive people. Yes. But they also, they kind of hunt her first, but right. then she hunts them back. <laughs> um, she hunts. Uh, Good jobs. Um, in lots of. Money. Yeah. I was to say like upward mobility. Yep. Um, she doesn't really have to hunt it. I don't know why I'm saying she's hunting it. Hunt's not the right word because these things just happen naturally to her. So <laughs> happened, just happens to naturally be pursued by attractive people, get good jobs, wear cool clothes, yes. drive cool cars. It's all yes. subjective. Yes. But she does all those things naturally. Naturally. Thank you for going on that journey with me, everyone. Yes. Uh, <sighs> last but not least, thank you so much to Caitlin K. And Caitlin. I had to, sorry, real quick. I had to look up the address because it's APOAP and I did not know what that is. And it is military address. <gasps> I yes. love us that. I do too. I really do. So thank um, you for your fucking service. And thank, thank you for your service. Listening to us. Seriously. Oh my God. I hope we have a military coven. Yep. Caitlin K. Caitlin K. Caitlin crack in the fuck on cracking skulls. You know, not really violently, just like. <laughs> in a cool way, like, like blowing people's minds because you're so cool. Thank you. Exactly. Also keeping them in line, you know. <laughs> yes. Come on, guys. Get in line. I'm Caitlin cracking. I'm going to crack your skulls a little bit gently. Yep. To get you in Yeah. Crack, cracking nuts <laughs> for other people when it's hard for them to get them open. Like when you have a pistachio, yes. but it's not, oh, doesn't man. have the slit, you know? Like those weird Christmas nut mixes. Yes. Yes. Walnuts. Hazelnuts. Yes. Brazil yes. nuts, I do believe, are in those mixes. Yes. She doesn't need the cracker. She no. either Crack uses them. her molars or her fist. Yes. <laughs> Crack them. Um... Kraken also hearts wide open fill right. them with love yep. every day every, every night every damn day every damn day <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh, gosh oh you guys we love Yay. you so much you so and much. we got the best 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 message 
ever, I mean, all of the messages you guys send are like very deeply, deeply fucking important. And I, that is not, I am, that right. is so true. It's not, it's I cannot not tell hyperbole. you. It is not hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cutest way to say that word ever. Um, it's not hyperbole. I cannot tell you how often <laughs> no, wait, I wait, wait. either. Sorry. Hyperbole. But Speak, what? No, speaking of cute ways to say things, my three-year-old yeah. the other day brought me a bowl of beads. Beads, like plastic beads. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, Mommy, look at my marbles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Marbles. <laughs> and my seven-year-old, who's pretty precocious, was like, they aren't, those aren't marbles. Those are beads. And I was like, they aren't, they are marbles. It's a whole <laughs> new category of thing, dude marbles so hush <laughs> sorry <laughs> we, yes let's go back to their messages which are very important to us yes but deeply equally as important as now forever everyone every time we'll see marbles we'll think marbles <laughs> um yes they're so fucking important for so many reasons a just because everyone feels bad about themselves sometimes and then yep. when people send you a really nice message that feels really good yep. and b you know it's like life happens and sometimes you're like oh my god why am i doing this podcast it's so dumb and it's not making the world any better and then you guys are like hey you literally saved my life Mm -hmm. last week or whatever and that's amazing yes truly fucking an honor um but somebody somebody was listening stoned i'll get to the reason why i'm telling the story in a minute but they were listening stoned we were talking about other dimensions dogs and how dogs trip us the fuck out and they wrote that they we're stoned listening and that just something blew their minds. <laughs> yes. And yes God. Which it would. Yes. So hard. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I made myself stoned talking about it during that episode. Yes. So I cannot imagine listening to it no. stoned. So thank you for that message. And the reason I brought it up is because it's posted on Instagram. So if you want to see the best message we've ever received and know conclusively that you are amongst your people because that message is fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Go to our Instagram, go to our Facebook, go to our Twitter at they will kill. You can email us at they will kill podcast at gmail.com. And you can go to our website, they will kill com. Do it. Rate review. Subscribe, please. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, AJ Bergans, for our music. Thank you. Do you know those Bergans babies, those twins? Are almost I don't want a year to talk old. about them. I don't want to talk about them. They're but too, I'm just letting way you know. too fucking cute. Is that thunder? Now that was a Dodge Challenger. I'm uh, guessing. I thought it was like the world was splitting open because the twins were turning a year old. <laughs> I've just wanted you to know that I think uh, legally, after children have been alive for 365 days, you can fully sue them. Yeah, I think you're my right. legal scholarly ways tell me that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's gonna, um, it's gonna happen, guys. Get ready. Get ready. <laughs> You're gonna depose your babies. <laughs> and remember, oh boy, get how your about vaccinations? Wear your masks. Well, definitely. Let's fucking crush COVID. That's stupid that we haven't done that yes. yet. Yes. Um. Oh, here's something that I forgot to mention months ago. Our dear listener Jim, who's an old old friend of Laura's. He sent us something, and I kept, I keep forgetting to mention it. It is croissant fucking bread. I'm sorry, what? Go look it up. Just Google croissant bread. It is a loaf of fucking bread that is made of croissant material. Um, I'm sorry. He yeah. sent it to us, like you and me? No, or you me and Laura. Laura. <laughs> yes. I was like, where the fuck is my croissant bread? You didn't share? <laughs> if I next giveaway we do, we're going to include croissant bread. God, I want it. Shit, you guys. It's sliced thick. It's a thick, like rolled up croissant. Oh my God. It's so good. So I need the world to know that that exists and go fucking get it. And if you show us proof, here you go. If you show us proof of a recent vaccination, <gasps> I will bread. send you a fucking bag of croissant bread. Shit, yeah. Like, it has to be post-dated Starting after, today. Yeah, yes. or August 30th. Uh, after post-marked August 30th, I will send you a croissant bread. So yep. shoot me a photo, email us a photo Shit, yeah. of your vaccination, and here comes a croissant bread. Yep, message me. You need a FaceTime buddy for your vaccine? 
Yep. I'm your girl. Live stream me for the rest of your life. I will keep an eye on your face for any <laughs> DNA yeah. changes, anything that yeah. I will do. Any really blood mag- clots, yeah. anything that Magnetic. you think that you might get, but there is a point zero 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 one six percent chance that you will actually get. I will monitor you for those things. Shit, yes. Yeah, anyway, we love you guys. We love you so much. And we won't see you next week, but we'll see you the week after. Yeah, we love you. We love you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, oh, I forgot. I was.